So Derek, you had offered to show your um, your Moonbeam project. Would you like to start us off, or would you like sure. me to start? Okay, cool. Yeah, well, I'm, happy, I'm happy to. So, um, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, like many others, I kind of uh, joined these calls, but you know, kind of wanted to find a project to start. You know, kind of uh, learning with. Um, so yeah, just like uh, uh, I'll I'll can share with you and kind of give you a little demo. But you know, the background or kind of the idea of the project is that kind of headed into this multi-chain future where and I think that Polkadot's going to like accelerate that where it's, you know, lowers like the barrier to like creating new blockchains. Mm -hmm. And I'm really interested in like DeFi use cases, but you know, all that's happening kind of only on Ethereum. And so the kind of the idea is, well, there's going to be all of these chains and all of these like assets and users on these chains that, you know, and there'll be some demand for kind of DeFi services like lending, borrowing, trading, these kinds of things. But, you know, it's kind of tough because it's hard to get those things to Ethereum. And, um, you know, it's even hard as a developer kind of because there's all these kind of individual chains that each only have some small amount of these things. So uh, I think the idea of the project is basically to create a place where you could build an application, a DeFi application would address like all of these, you know, remote, you know, tokens and users basically in these, you know, on these chains. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so the, the, you know, I kind of just was doing learning, you know, it's quite a bit of learning, just I haven't been hands on like uh, coding in quite some time. So it was kind of like Rust substrate, JavaScript, Git, like didn't even exist last time I was doing any. So, you know, it was a bunch of learning here, but let me, uh, why don't I kind of um, share my screen and give you guys a, a quick, uh, you know, kind of quick demo here. Uh, so there's two uh, GitHub repos, one that has kind of the backend node implementation in it and one that has like, um, you know, the front end. And basically I started with the substrate node template and the um, kind of React UI template as just kind of starting points, uh, you know, for this, uh, you know, for the proof of concept. And um, so why don't we, um, uh, we can just kind of like fire things up here. So uh, what I'll do is I'll, let me, let me purge the chain so we can start fresh. So I'll fire up uh, the backend node, and then uh, let's start the kind of front end here. And so the, the first use case that, you know, this kind of use case I was after is, um, you know, quite interested, as I mentioned, in kind of some of these DeFi use cases, uh, you know, on Ethereum. So in particular, I was, uh, I'm, was looking at um, uh, the way there's a, there's a uh, project called Uniswap on Ethereum that implements basically a DEX. Uh, so a way to trade uh, tokens, but it's pretty interesting. I mean, unlike if you've been on other exchanges, you know, usually the way this works is that you have like an order book and then the system is kind of matching uh, like people that want to sell a token with people that want to buy it. You know, that's how a traditional exchange works. Uh, but the way Uniswap works on, um, on Ethereum is that it uses what's called an automated market making formula. And so what happens is you kind of trade against the system, basically. You don't trade against another person. You like are always trading against the system. And that has, you know, some interesting properties where, you know, basically like there's always, you can always execute a trade basically, right? Whereas in other systems, you know, if there's no one, no other party to take the other side of the trade, you can't trade basically. And uh, so, what I, you know, and what I see happening over there is then that because it's kind of like this always on system that you can always trade with, then people are using that as a building block to even build other things on top, right? Where you can have like other applications and other systems that then, you know, call into the APIs of this underlying kind of exchange service to create, you know, higher level DeFi kind of services that kind of compose, composing the features basically. Um, so, you know, there's quite a bit of activity going on in this end in Ethereum. And I wanted to kind of use that as a, uh, you know, kind of a trial, you know, kind of a, a, a little bit of a meteor project or a little project to kind of dig into to learn substrate rust and all of these things. So um, just to explain a little bit of what you're seeing here. So this, I kind of modified the substrate, you know, kind of front end UI, React UI template um, uh, that I used as a starting point. So some of the widgets are kind of the same as what you see in just the default template, if you ever use that, but some of them I've kind of modified to my own ends here. So, um, you know, you can see kind of the current block number being produced uh, and one being finalized. And, you know, in this, in this kind of little proof of concept system I have, there's basically three different like digital assets. Uh, there's three different types. So there's something I'm just calling token. There's something I'm calling glimmer, GLMR, and there's something I'm calling liquid. So there's three different you know digital tokens that you can uh, own in this system. 
And you know, the, I'll kind of get to the functions down here. All these functions down here are basically what you use to kind of interact with uh, this kind of simple kind of exchange uh, you know, that I've set up. So um, let's do this. So why don't, I, um, why don't I kind of populate the system? So right now, like everything is zero. So we need to give ourselves some of these tokens to kind of start using the system. And so what I'll do is, um, let's see here, I think I have, uh, so I have just the polkadot.js apps um, UI here. It's connected to um, you know, my local node. Uh, yep, so I see the numbers going up. So I'm just gonna call uh, some functions via the pseudo module here to just kind of populate, um, you know, to give my user some, uh, some uh, tokens basically. So I have these kind of setter functions that are only callable by, uh, by root. Let's just say, let's give Alice a million of these. So I'm, I'm setting basically uh, this Glimmer digital asset, a million of those for her. And then let's call the set function here. I'll give her also a million of, of these uh, tokens basically. So you can see those fitters. So now if I go back to the UI, you can see here that, you know, these two widgets here have been kind of updated, right? So now it shows that, you know, as Alice, my balance is 1 million of, of these uh, Glimmer tokens and 1 million of tokens. And so the way that you work with the exchange, there's kind of two different participants uh, to this style, of, uh, this style of exchange. So one participant is called a liquidity provider and the other uh, kind of participant is just a trader, right? So a liquidity provider, basically what they're doing is they're depositing tokens into the exchange. And for that kind of service or for providing those tokens to the exchange, they get, um, they get basically like a return. So um, as people are trading on the exchange, uh, there's like a fee that's extracted. The fee goes back to the people who provided the liquidity into the exchange. So I think right now I have it set to like a 0.3% fee. So whenever you trade on the system, 0.3% of the value of the trade gets put into, you know, gets captured back into these like reserves in the exchange, but really they're accruing to anyone that kind of um, provided liquidity. So the idea is that like, you know, this is a place where you can kind of like deposit your tokens and you'll get like a return you know, as a liquidity provider. Um, and then as a trader, obviously you can move right now, this is kind of like hardwired to just be trading in this pair. So there's kind of glimmer and tokens is kind of the trading pair here. I mean, if this were a real exchange, there'd probably be many different tradable pairs, but in, in, I just kind of, this is kind of the, the, I kind of narrowed it down to the simplest possible um, kind of configuration here. So what we'll do is, so I have right now as this user, a million of these and a million of these. So let's just do, let's kind of act in this role of the liquidity provider. I'm going to just make a deposit here. So let's say, let's say I, um, uh, what's it, 250,000, let's do 250,000 of those. So I'll, I'll do a deposit of 250,000 Glimmer and 500,000 tokens. So let's just do that. So, so, so Derek, you're, as, as Alice, you're gonna act as a liquidity provider here and you're gonna provide liquidity both in both tokens in Glimmer and token. That's is that right. the idea? That's okay, right. and is it, that's right. does it have to be that way? Like if I'm someone who has a bunch of Glimmer but no token, is it acceptable to just provide one or the other? Uh, you can, so there's some subtleties here. You can, uh, well, not when you first, when you initialize the uh, exchange, you have to provide both. Because okay. there's always basically a reserve that has some value of, of each of these. Okay. After that, um, you, uh, I mean, the way I've set it up is it'll always basically do uh, an equivalent value of each. And because okay. that's kind of the rational thing to do. I think you can put in just one or the other, but anytime you do that, I guess you basically will move the price and you'll create a situation where you'll lose money basically. Um, oh, interesting. Okay. So there's some, there, there are some subtleties here where like basically, and uh, <clears throat> the way that it works is, so let me just kind of step back here. So I just did this deposit of both. For that deposit, I got out some liquid here. So that means that, you know, I have kind of, th these represent like, my, uh, like a, uh, a, you know, my ownership basically of the reserves that are now in the exchange. So these, you know, these, tokens left my balances are now in the quote in the exchange and I, I got back out these liquid tokens which represent kind of my ownership of you know right now 100% of the reserve but if there were other people depositing it would be kind of like my portion of the reserves that are in here and so and kind of a little bit of the, the the magic here is that so you have these these two reserves here and now there's a kind of a formula that's used to compute the price for any trades so you can see here that and this is just kind of a unit price for each of these but I deposited kind of twice as much of one as of the other. 
And so the price for you know, one token is half of a glimmer and the, the price of one glimmer is two tokens basically. The price is basically defined by the ratio of like these two reserves. This is how you know, uh, Uniswap works and kind of what I did here. And, um, and so like, you know, now since there's like reserves in here, uh, now I can go about kind of trading them. So let's say that, you know, let's say I wanted to purchase like Glimmer and so I'll spend 50,000 tokens to buy, buy Glimmer. If I do that pretty fast, you'll see here, it was kind of happened pretty fast, but you know, my, my Glimmer balance went up, my token balance went down, you know, I shifted the reserves. So basically I put in tokens into the, into the, 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 the exchange and I got out, you know, Glimmer basically. So I shifted kind of the balance of these two reserve items. And that also changed like the price now. So the price is now different because the ratio of these two things is different. There, um, may I ask and you a I, question? Yeah, sure, go ahead. Uh, about the token price, uh, as uh, from definition of constant price product markets, so X, Y, K markets, uh, right. that price is right only for the first token traded. But if you're trading more tokens, the total price will be different. So That's basically correct. the price uh, is not, uh, changing in the moment of the trade but when you are trading you buy an actually first token cheaper and last token that's, bit that's more expensive that's yeah, do you have, yeah do you have a calculation for the total price for example when you <laughs> yes. buy more that's... tokens so it should show us to oh yeah it shows how many tokens to spend but it does not show us how many tokens do we get that's absolutely right. And that's, you know, that this is, uh, Josh, if you remember from last time, this is why I was asking for like this RPC call. Cause right now, uh, you know, I was, and I didn't have a chance to update it to, to do that, but basically uh, that is absolutely missing. And, and, you know, right now this is just showing the unit price. So this is the price of just buying one. Uh, but, you know, the price is different. Like when I just bought 50,000 here, like I got some different price than to kind of the unit price. And so this is where like in my implementation, I'm not sure if you heard last week, but you know, I need like uh, some way to call like an RPC function that will compute the price. So I can show, if you put in 50,000 here, it would show the, you know, what you're gonna get basically. Because Yeah, not I do remember that. That's, our, that's actually our next topic. So I'm glad that these ended up being on, on the same week. And that, that was a cool comment too. So the idea is like, if, if you buy a bunch of tokens or a bunch of Glimmer, like you're not getting the same price for each one, those prices there are like for the, or like the margin, like the, the very first one you buy and then it's like recalculated and you pay a different price for the next one. Yeah. It's, it, I mean, this is something where it's like, it's a simple, the implementation is simple, but like the thinking about it, like you have gone through different, like, you know, down different rabbit holes, just even thinking about it. So I think the way, the way I would describe it is that there's kind of like a, a function, right. That determines the price. And it looks kind of like a, you know, Y equals one over X kind of, kind of function. So basically like what the behavior is that basically as you buy increasingly more of one, like the price keeps going up and up and up, right? So there's kind of like resistance as you like buy more and more and you deplete like the reserves of like one or the other, you know, the, the price kind of goes up and up and up. So, um, so if you think about it, it's kind of a way where like whatever the demand is in the market for that's, you know, that expresses itself across this pair, it kind of like finds like the equilibrium point on this curve of like that reflects like the, the appropriate kind of price. And back to your comment, if you, if something happens, someone does a big trade that moves the price a lot, you know, I think the system relies on like arbitragers who would like see that and they see like on Binance, oh, it's this, but here it's some other price. It relies on, on, on arbitragers to step in and basically correct the price because there's like a, a revenue opportunity for them to do so basically because they can buy it either cheaper, you know, cheaper than like the, the fairly market rate price. So, yeah. So an, as an arbitrager is the idea there that like, Oh yeah. So you're saying like someone does a big tra trade on your exchange. And so then the price kind of goes, you know, changes significantly. And then maybe my job as an arbitrager is to say like, Whoa, the price on this pure stake exchange is like kind of a lot different at least right now than some other exchanges. So maybe I'll like trade one way on this exchange and then trade back the other way on the other exchange and hope to like make some profit on the, the different rates. That's correct. That's right. Okay, cool. And I think that's happening right now like on, on Uniswap. That's happening. There's a whole bunch of people either providing liquidity or doing arbitrage like, you know, around the system. Yeah. It's kind of a money-making kind of thing, right? So. Uh, Derek, if yeah. I'm allowed to ask one more question. Yeah, of First course. Of all, Go ahead. Thank you. I'm really excited to see your, uh, your product, uh, your project, because we are working in the same direction too. Okay. Uh, and uh, it would be nice if you can share some source codes, if it's possible. 
the, the, the repos are public. So like, uh, you know, I'm, yeah, I can probably, if I can figure out how to message in here, or maybe Josh, yeah, I think you have them if you could just post Yeah, them. I'll drop them for you. And uh, do you currently support the native tokens of the network, you know, the balances model? No. So that is also another to do. So I think I put in the notes and kind of the readme on there that, you know, so right now, for example, you see Alice has yep. this balance up here. This is like not meaningful right now in my system. I just have, and we'll look at the code. I mean, I just have, um, uh, you know, data structures that, you know, have like uh, balances that are associated with different accounts that are kind of independent of the underlying currency implementation of the system. Yeah. But oh, I think right. that is obviously a direction where I'd want at least one of the trading pair would be the underlying, you know, kind of, uh, uh, you know, I'd want that to be the underlying currency of the, the actual system itself, if it makes sense. Yeah, and I believe in the future it will be cool if uh, the system will support native balances of different parachains at once. That's right. I've been thinking about this as well, because I think that, you know, right now it doesn't even really exist, but there needs to be some sort of oh, yeah. standard token representation if there's going to be like movement of these things, you know, across parachains, right? Using, I saw there was a new like research kind of paper, you know, from Web3 released, but, you know, kind of the idea of this cross-chain communication, you know, kind of one of the obvious first use cases will be token movement, but in order for there to be token movement, there needs to be some, uh, you know, agreed upon standard that the different parachains can implement so that, tokens from one chain can be kind of adequately represented if it moves to another chain, right? For example, to access services such as this. Yes, exactly. So, thank you. Yeah, sure. So, um, so you know, I kind of traded in one direction here. I mean, you can just see that if I, let's just, you know, trade in the other direction here. So I'm going to spend Glimmer to buy tokens. So I'm basically going in the opposite direction here, you know, that kind of happened fast. I changed this, but you note that the price kind of moved a bunch. The reserve balances kind of got changed. So I can kind of move, you know, in different directions. And obviously I'm doing this all as one user, but it would be different users, you know, interacting with this thing that would be potentially moving uh, things in different directions. And then, you know, in my role as liquidity provider, I could say, okay, well, you know, there's been some trades have happened. Some fees have gotten collected. So actually the fees gotten collected have kind of accumulated into here. And so if I were to withdraw my full balance, you know, I would get out like slightly more than what I'd put in basically. So like this, it's kind of a system where like, it's kind of as activity happens, you know, there's like an accrual of additional tokens into the reserve. And then you get that as the liquidity provider. So, you know, you can withdraw, let's say, you know, let's say I withdraw 50,000 you know, of these. Um, so basically what happened is I gave up 50,000 of these liquid tokens and I used that to withdraw a portion of the reserves that went back into my balances basically. So these are now gone from the exchange and back in my personal balances. Um, so I, I'm kind of using one user to play all the roles. So it's a, li a little weird, but obviously there would be potentially different people as a liquidity provider. And then there'd be like different people as the traders basically uh, on the system. And um, you can see some events down here and so forth. So, so you, you said like as a as a liquidity provider, I can basically just deposit some of my tokens into the exchange, and then they you know they sit there as reserves, and they get traded back and forth with traders, and then later you can withdraw them. And the idea was like you know if I'm a liquidity provider, then I expect to just get some small return on the on my tokens for the time that they were in the exchange, right? That's right. And so when you when you first deposited some liquidity, you can see the numbers still in the UI there. You did like 250K and 500K, and then you showed us the prices were like r almost two and almost half. So is the almost there, is that where the like extra funds that get paid to the liquidity providers come from? Like you're trading that's right. that's a little right. bit. It's like slightly less than half. So it's like, you know, and I can show you when we get to the code, but basically, uh, there's like, you, there's a math that's being done. Like when you're, when you're getting prices that like, uh, you know, kind of uh, account for this extra fee that then accrues to the liquidity providers. Yeah. So there's no like profit that goes to like the creators or anything like this, but it's basically just kind of, um, you know, it's an incentive for people to provide liquidity in here. And you realize in the system you need, you know, you know, if you don't have a lot of liquidity in the exchange, then, you know, like I was doing where you do a trade and like the price gets shifted like a huge amount, basically it's like not that efficient. So as with any exchange, you need liquidity to kind of have it be efficient, basically, if you're going to, you know, use it to do things like trading or to understand what the prices are. Yeah, yeah. So, and I have another question, and maybe this is more of a code question, too. So you said no, um, at the moment, none of the token, like the token or the glimmer, those are not the underlying asset that comes, like, from the balances palette. So what do those come from? Is that the assets palette, or is that a smart contract? 
I, you know, I did a, the simplest thing I could. So I just have like a, you know, I, I have like a, like a, just like data structures and decal storage that are of type balance basically. Oh um, yeah. Cool. So, uh, and we can take a look at that if that makes sense at this point. I don't like look at the code of it or I don't, I don't know if other people have, I don't see anything else here. Yeah, code, code sounds good to me. Okay, so why don't I take a look here. So, you know, on the back end node implementation, you know, I've put most of the code into this like moonbeam.rs. And, um, you know, just to look at this, we can just look at the storage items here basically, right? So there's, you know, the three different assets that, you know, that I pointed out in the UI are represented by, you know, these three pairs of uh, data storage items basically here, right? So there's a balances, um, data structure, which is, uh, you know, an account key map that just goes to a, like a balance basically that each account would have. And then I have like a separate, um, you know, a balance for what's in the exchange basically. It's just a, a single balance. Same thing with tokens, same thing with liquid. And then this is kind of like a hack right now because I haven't had a chance to go back and do that RPC thing, but I just have like a single variable that contains the unit price for each of these things that I'm using to display the price. But you know, as was pointed out, this is not quite correct because it's just the unit price, not the price of like whatever the trade is that's about to happen. Ah, uh, this is okay. I remember last week when you were describing this hack a little bit, like you weren't sure how to do the RPC. And so, but it's, there's already like default RPCs for querying your storage values. So you made it a storage value. And then like at the end of all, anything that mutates storage, then you also just make sure you update these two special ones. Correct. That's right. Yeah. Cool. That's right. Okay. That's right. Um, and then I'll skip over. There's just some convenience functions like the ones we use that are callable only by root uh, or via the pseudo module. And then, but here's like where some of the more interesting things are. So for example, the, on the deposit liquidity, um, you know, there's a bunch, it kind of is a little bit verbose here. And again, this is my like learning rust. So I'm sure there's like, you know, there's things that aren't very good rust here, but, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I was trying to follow from some of the examples I saw, you know, the advice was, well, do like a bunch of checking first, right? So you kind of, I have a bunch of, so insurers and other kinds of checking here for different kinds of like error conditions. And then kind of at the bottom of these functions is where I'm like performing like the storage, uh, kind of the, the storage like uh, actions. So I think in this one, there's kind of a branch where if you're initializing, you know, the, uh, the exchange for the first time that you kind of are in this branch and then for like an incremental um, uh, add of liquidity, you're kind of in this, in this kind of branch up here basically. And, um, you know, this is kind of this, this update prices thing we were just talking about, Joshi, where it's like I'm kind of updating the prices and depositing an event right before kind of after the storage changes have happened, but before I kind of exit the function. And, uh, you know, a similar kind of thing for withdrawing liquidity. You know, here's kind of some of the stuff I did. You know, a lot of it was just like a learning exercise for me. And then there's functions for trading kind of in one direction and the other direction. Uh, as the kind of the main dispatchable uh, functions. And um, I'll go down, I mean, there was a little bit interesting here where, um, yeah, this pricing function, this is where like, I had to do some math. And so this, you know, this took a little bit of thinking to try to figure out, you know, how to do it because the math didn't work kind of the way I, I was expecting it when I was trying to do it directly with balances. So I had to like convert into like a regular like rust primitives basically to be able to do the math uh, that I wanted. So these are kind of everything's, you know, these balances are being converted into like U128s. But then there's, you know, there's always all these kind of error conditions that can happen either on the conversions or on the math basically, right? So I was trying to be um, defensive in terms of different kinds of things that could happen. But in the end here, you can see here, so you see this like special value like 997 and here's like a thousand. So this is kind of part of going to the question you had, Josh, of like when you are getting the price, you know, there's ultimately kind of like a multiplication by 997 over 1000 that's happening as part of the equation. That's basically like reducing what you get by three one thousandths, basically. And this is kind of a special value where I think, you know, as a parachain, this would probably be like a magic value that might be subject to governance or something because you might want to change this because the, the dynamic here is that, you know, in this exchange, if, uh, you know, if you make this number big, that attracts liquidity, but it's like worse for the traders because they're going to have more fees on their trades. If you make it low, 
that's like better for the trade for people using the system, but you know, less attractive than for someone providing liquidity. So there's some, you know, there's probably tuning that, you know, might be appropriate to happen to whatever this value is, you know, over, over time or according to market conditions or other things. Yeah, this is, this is interesting that, so there's like, I was thinking of a couple different places where you might store this value. And one is like where you have it now, just in the code. Another one is that you could make it um, like part of your configuration trait, you know, how every pallet has a, a trait. And if you put it there, then it's configurable like at chain launch. So, you know, you can decide it then, um, but not change it in the future, which gives you like a little bit more flexibility than having it right here in the code. And then the third, third place I thought of is you can have it in a storage value. And if it's in a storage value, then it's like you said, it can be subject to all kinds of governance. You know, you can have a, a dispatchable function that like changes that number that probably is only callable by root or something like that. So how would that work? I guess you'd have that and then I guess you'd use the governance uh, frame palettes would be like, well, if you didn't have the pseudo module, but you had the governance frame palettes, you would have like a successful, a successful governance vote would invoke like a call to that function with root privileges. Yeah, yep, like exactly. Yeah. So if you have it, so like the design would be instead of coding it here on line 360, you have an additional storage value. That part I think probably makes sense. Right. And then you have a dispatchable function that you call like um, set. Uh, I don't know what, what is that number called? Is there a name for that? I guess it would just be the fee, I guess, or something. Yeah, like right. Yeah. yeah, set set fee or whatever. And then the first thing you do is ensure root. And then when by doing ensure root, you've abstracted away out of your module, like where root comes from. A simple answer is it could come from pseudo. Another fairly simple answer is like it could come from democracy. Then it would work kind of the same way it does in, in Kusama, you know, where someone puts forward a proposal and it gets supported and becomes a referenda and all that. And then another option is like, if you don't like either of those and you want some other governance mechanism, like obviously you're always welcome to write another separate palette that does that. Hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I, you know, it's obviously not a, a huge amount of code here, but it was a good like learning exercise. I think to just have some real thing to kind of uh, try out. Um, I can show you basically, uh, you know, on the UI side, you know, again, I kind of started with the React, um, you know, uh, Substrate UI template and just like modified it to taste, uh, you know, I kind of, you know, use some of the existing modules as kind of examples, but like made my own, um, you know, React um, components. Um, for, so for example, um, uh, you know, so for example, Glimmer balances, I think we're looking at here, right? So. Uh, this shows up, um, you know, this is like what reports the user balance. And you can see here that, um, you know, it's using kind of the polka.js uh, query to query that exposed kind of function that we saw in the, the runtime on the storage variable, uh, but passing in the account address that's selected in the UI uh, and then displaying it, um, you know, down here basically, right? It's where it kind of gets displayed in the returned um, markup. Yeah. GSX, I think it is, right? So this has changed a lot since I last did any kind of like front-end programming, which was not a lot to begin with. But, uh, you know, this, all this React stuff is pretty crazy, actually. I also learned React as part of learning Substrate. Yeah. <laughs> it, it was on my list for like, I don't know, over a year for sure. And then when I, when I got to Parity, it was a, you know, a popular tool. And I was like, okay, it's finally time. <laughs> So I think, uh, I don't know if there's anything else anyone wants to see, but I think that probably gives you an overall sense of the thing. Uh, one more thing, Derek, I just sure. got an idea. How to sure. make the calculation of price without uh, RPC code? Yeah. Because uh, basically price is an equilibrium point of the curve, as you said, and the curve is totally described by your current state of storage you can make the cal calculation of price on front end side. Yeah, I, I had uh, actually Joshi kind of, I think had suggested that last time as one possible solution. So that is a solution, right? You could code in like uh, the function, basically just get the raw values out and compute the price client side. I guess it feels like a less good, you know, less good um, implementation than having the back end and the node tell you what the price is, but it's certainly possible because I kind of figure like, you know, you might get some differences in implementation on like the, in the JavaScript on the client side in different browsers would tell you like a different price. 
uh, probably not, but you know what I mean? There, there seems like there's like more risk somehow of something not, you know, not being consistent, I guess, if you do a client side, uh, but it's definitely possible. At least you're right. It's the same formula that would be used. Okay. Makes sense. Yeah. The, the other disadvantage of doing it client side, and you're right, that is exactly what I recommended <laughs> last week when you asked about it. The, the other disadvantage is like, if it makes it more challenging for someone else to come along and write their own UI. Like maybe they want to use this DAP you've created, but they either don't like your UI or they want to integrate it into some bigger UI that they've already used. Like giving them the burden of re-implementing that formula is sort of an extra piece as opposed to just saying like, hey, the node can tell you that. Here's the, the call. So that, that'll be a to do is to, you know, on this is to update it to use the, um, you know, this RPC mechanism that you pointed me to some examples. So I just yeah. don't have to do that yet. Cool. And another thing I wanted to, to mention here is like, I don't know if this is a, how serious this is going to be or if it was mostly just learning. Um, but uh, there's, there's also this palette that comes with substrate. It's called assets. And it in many ways is like balances, but the difference is it supports um, arbitrarily many assets and I, I'm sure there's a it might be like a limit of 256 or I forget what the limit is but like a lot um, and that might be a way to take this and like generalize it to more trading pairs because mm -hmm. like right in the current design you'll have to add a you know another pair of storage items for each token you want to support so it's you know just a, a thought if it's something that you end up yeah. still working on. I'll take a look at that I mean one of the other th I mean the, the way that the system, you know, Uniswap works on Ethereum. One of the good parts, I mean, there's a lot of downsides to have being smart contract based, but one of the good parts about that system is that anyone can add a new trading pair by deploying like a new smart contract that uh, kind of registers itself. Yeah. So, you know, on, you know, this is obviously a, a substrate runtime implementation requires kind of like a, you know, a whole runtime upgrade to basically change it. So one thing I was thinking about is like, well, A, could it just be done as like a, you know, as a smart contract implementation, like in the contracts module, or could it be even a hybrid where there's some part that's like, you know, user deployable, you know, to maybe create new pairs, but there's still some core logic like in the runtime. So you'd have kind of a hybrid situation. Um, so those are kind of future. Yeah, things. that's a really cool idea. I just remembered when you said that I was reading over your, your readme and part of what you had done to prepare this was install the contracts module on the chain. Is that the, why you had done that? I think, yeah. And also I just wanted to, you know, learn and be able to use it. So, uh, yeah, yeah, cool. Yeah. This is a super cool project, Eric. I, I haven't seen anything like it. Very awesome. No, well, thanks. Yeah. I mean, I think I want to, you know, I kind of have, um, you know, kind of uh, gearing this towards kind of like a, a parachain, right? So, you know, yeah. start kind of like a, a new project around a parachain that would provide these kind of services potentially to other parachains and other chains, right? Uh, um, okay, so I, I just want to do a little diagram of how this, like the different pieces of the node work together in, in what I'm about to show for this RPC thing, because there's a, a couple different layers and the parts that were hard for me were wiring all the different layers together, specifically like crossing between runtime logic and outer node logic. And so I'll just show how that works. So like if we think about the, the whole node here, there's like this whole big thing that's the node and it has um, a bunch of pieces in it. And uh, one of them, the one that we've talked about a ton is the runtime. And so I'll put the runtime here. And so like most of the examples that I've shown on the call and I think, you know, Derek's included, the interesting parts of the development happened inside the runtime. And that's part of the beauty of Substrate is that generally you only have to write your own runtime logic because you can just use all of our transaction queuing and peer to peer stuff and, you know, consensus and whatever else out of the box, unless you want to add something to it or do something unique, like for example, a custom RPC. And so then that's another piece that goes in here. There's this, um, I don't know what they call it, like RPC client or service or um, something like that. And what it does is it gives us these connection lines to the outside world. Um, so like with an R, I mean, that's what RPC is. It's a remote procedure call. So using the RPC, you can have some external app, like for example, um, it could be, and probably will be like Polkadot API that connects up to one of these RPC endpoints or in a more basic example, like I know people use curl a lot and I'll, I'll show that today too. So any kind of other application, whatever it is that you're using can connect to the node and query it for information through the RPC. Okay, and then this RPC thing, like 
it doesn't contain all the interesting information that someone might want to know about itself. It has to ask other parts of the node for that. So for example, let me just show consensus down here. One of the RPC calls that's built in is one where you can get the, or it shouldn't say built in, but it comes with the default substrate node or the node template is the one where you can ask for like, who are the current consensus authorities? So the RPC communicates with this consensus component that way. Okay, fine, that makes sense. We could also ask it for stuff um, like the Genesis block hash and it'll com communicate with some other part of the node to get that information. Um, but what we're interested in today, because like we said, most of our development happens in the runtime, uh, is getting the RPC to communicate with the runtime. So we'll put a little link here. And the way that any part of the node that's outside of the runtime is able to communicate with the runtime is what we call a runtime API. So let me just label this little arrow. Um, this is called a runtime API. Okay, so basically what a runtime API is is it's like um, it's a function in the runtime that you can call from outside of the runtime and so you ask the runtime a question it gives you back an answer so for example we've seen the ones where you ask it like what's the value of this particular storage item and those runtime apis exist there by default and there's some others and we can we can look at the other ones that that come in there so maybe i'll draw a couple of those because there's a bunch um, okay cool so the first bit of our architecture is going to be adding in one of, I'll just stick with the same color, adding in one of these communication lines from the outside world into this RPC thing. The second part is we're going to add in one of these runtime APIs so that the RPC thing can communicate with the runtime itself. And then since we're using um, frame, like Parity's framework for building runtimes, and that's just means like we're composing these palettes just like we've done all along, then if we show a little bit more detail in the runtime, then there's all these different palettes. Like we could call it palette one, for example, and palette two. Okay, and so the final thing that we're gonna have to do is show how to call not just to the runtime itself, not just to like runtime source librs, but actually call into a specific palette. So something like that. And I've, I've kind of used uh, blue here to indicate this is a no STD thing. It has to compile the WASM. Probably I should have shown like half of each of these as blue. Okay. So the, the chain of communication from one of our runtime palettes to an outside world endpoint is from the palette to the runtime, that part's pretty straightforward. From the runtime via a runtime API to the rest of the node, that part wasn't totally trivial. And then from the RPC, which is, you know, part of the outer node to the outside world. And, um, you know, uh, that part was kind of kind of medium to code. So I think the first thing I'll show is uh, one of these guys, one of these ones that is just an RPC endpoint and it, it won't have anything to do with the runtime. And then I'll work up to one that does work on the runtime. Um, so there's a nice scribbled diagram. I'm sure it'll go straight on substrate.dev. <laughs> Oh, okay. So Phil says, does that mean the RPC code has to be updated to stay in sync with the version of the runtime on chain? Okay. That's a, that's a really good question. So if you're, so it's called a runtime API, right? Which means you define just the function signatures that you can ask the runtime. So if you want to, if you want to change what, how the runtime answers the questions you're asking it, like if, you know, maybe there's a, let's say there's a runtime API called like my API and you want to change the logic about how you calculate the result. That's just a regular runtime upgrade. No big deal there. But if you want to change what kinds of questions you can ask or like add runtime APIs or change the signatures of them, then yes, you have to also update the, the outer part of the node. Um, but if you, so the, then the, the question is like, okay, well, what happens if you don't? So let's say we have some chain, it's a thousand blocks deep and we decide, okay, there's, we want to add some new runtime API and connect that to an RPC. And we do the runtime upgrade, that part goes fine. And then some people are like, I'm not updating my nodes. I don't feel like updating it. That isn't catastrophic. It doesn't cause like a consensus failure or anything like that. What it means is just those nodes that didn't upgrade don't support that particular RPC. 
So it doesn't break the chain or anything terrible. It's less chaotic than, you know, other, other things could be, um, but not every node will support it. And then, in, okay, so now Phil says, is there any way for the RPC code to check uh, whether the runtime version has changed? I'm removing my answer from the original seminar because it was wrong. The way you can check a runtime version is through the core runtime APIs, which is anything that implements this trait, including frame-based runtimes like ours. And you can see the first API it provides is called version right here, returns the version of the runtime. So I've got my node running. It's got 35 blocks. They're mostly empty. And I'm just going to make an RPC call to this first like silly RPC thing that I added. And let me copy it. So. Um, I added three RPC calls, and the first two are just silly ones. Um, this one's called hello5, and it's just a constant thing that always returns the number five. So let me make that call. Um, and so you can see, I, you know, I connect to my regular endpoint, localhost 9933. Um, I give it, like, you know, we're using JSON RPC 2.0 and all that stuff. And, like, here's the interesting parts and the parts that you'll have to change when you're doing your own. I tell it what RPC method I'm gonna call, and I tell it what parameters that RPC method needs. And in our case, it doesn't need any, but in general, they do need some. And so it, you know, it comes back and says like, yep, I am still using JSON RPC 2.0. And the answer to your query, the thing the RPC responded with was just the number five. And then I added another one that's just as trivial. That's this one, hello seven. And it comes back and says, the result is seven. Okay, so we'll look at the code that did that, and then I'll move on to one that uses a runtime API. Um, oh, yeah. Joshi, is that code communicates with RPC model or with runtime, runtime API? What was that? Uh, the code that curl request, does it communicate with a runtime API or with RPC model? Yeah, what I just what I just showed right now when I called curl, it communicates to just the RPC portion. And okay. yeah, and because that's like such a trivial RPC call that I showed, like it literally always returns five or, or seven. Um, it doesn't have anything to do with the runtime, just the outer part of the node is handling that one. But I, I think it's still worth showing because it shows how you like add an RPC extension and all that stuff. Oh, yes, definitely. Yeah. So, um, okay, so here's the node template folder. So this is the main substrate repo we're looking at here. Um, and maybe I'll make this stuff a little bit bigger. And inside the node template, this looks really similar there. This is basically the same structure as the regular old node template. And so um, inside our source, like I think you guys might be familiar with the chain spec file and mostly this is stuff that we don't touch. But in this case, um, since we're working on the outer node, we did touch it. And in particular, I added this file that I just called sillyrpc.rs. And it's only 25 lines of code, which is nice. Um, and there's, there's basically a few things you have to do. You have to define a trait that tells what the methods are going to be. So there's this special syntax and like, you know, you can memorize it. And if you use it enough, you probably will. But my plan is like, I'm just going to copy this as an example every time I have to do it. Um, so I called it silly RPC, and then you can put as many different RPC methods in here as you want, and you give them a name. And in Substrate, there's a convention that the name should be like, uh, you know, a category, and then an underscore, and then a particular, uh, like, method name. So if we look back at apps, we can see some other examples of that. Uh, oh, yeah, in fact, they even have them as two separate drop downs here. So like, this one is called author underscore insert key or author underscore pending extrinsics. And so when you name one, you always want to name them like that. Some kind of category, then the underscore, then the specific name. And then here we just give it the, the signature. It always needs an instance of self. I got stuck on that for a while. And it always returns a result for something. So once you've defined the trait that like, you know, describes your RPC method signatures, then you can make a struct Sometimes this struct will actually have fields. If you're going to communicate with the runtime, you're going to need a field that holds uh, what they call the client. And I'll, I'll show you that when we get there. But for this silly one, it's simple enough that this is just a unit struct. So it, it doesn't have any fields or anything. Um, and the reason that I've created it is so that I can actually implement the silly RPC for this struct. 
So you can see it has the same two functions with the same signatures and then these um, long complex implementation bodies here um, that just always return the, the constant value. Okay, so that's all good. We wrote this all in this one file, but what we haven't done yet is wired it up to the actual node. Like we you know, explained an RPC and how it would work, but we haven't actually told the node itself to use this RPC. And so the place that that happens is over here in service.rs. So service.rs in general is like the piece of code that weaves together all of these different parts of the node. So like in that block diagram, you know, I showed there's the node and then there's like the runtime and the RPC and consensus and there's other stuff that I didn't even bother to show transaction queue, P2P networking, all that stuff gets wired together in the service.rs file. Um, so, okay, so here we are in service.rs. I'll, I'll give you a little bit of context. And I guess the context will start here. So there's this macro called new full start and it says starts a service builder for a full service. Um, if basically, if we're talking about a full node, we're gonna use this. And before we dig into the guts of it, let me just give you a little bit more context. Um, there's a function that uses that macro. And then down below even further, there's another function called new light. And in the node template, it's just a function new light, but in the full substrate node, there's even another uh, macro for like the new light start. And this is for when you're doing a light client. Now, I personally have not modified this portion at all. And what that means is I haven't even taught light clients how to use this RPC that we're writing. That might be easier, it might not be, but I didn't do it because I just wanted something that worked right away. So, um, you know, that's, that's something to explore in the future, how to get these in the light clients. So, okay, so anyway, the part where I was modifying code here was in new full start. Um, and if we just look at the structure of this thing, we, uh, we let builder equal SC service, so that's substrate client service, and we use this service builder thing that comes with substrate. I didn't write any of this code, this is just from service.rs. Um, and then you can see what we, what we do on this object is we do like with select chain, with transaction pool, with import queue. So basically what we're saying is like create one of these service builders and by default, it's just this like boring, simple thing. It's almost like in my diagram, it would just be a circle labeled node with nothing in it. And then we go in and we say, okay, here's the, uh, the select chain rule we're going to use. So that was just longest chain. And then we say, okay, we're going to need a transaction pool. And then all of this code sets up a, a basic uh, transaction pool that comes along with substrate. Like, in fact, here it is, basic pool new. Okay, great. So now we've thrown in some of these pieces into our, you know, into that box. Um, here's another one, like import queue. And we can just go through all of these things. Um, and now here's the one we care about with RPC extensions. And we're, this is the code we're gonna dig into. I'll dig in it in a second. But just to get through this macro, after we've made this service with all of these things chucked into it, then we just go ahead and, and return that stuff. And, um, you know, like we could ask a million good questions about like what exactly is an import setup, what's in inherent data providers. I don't really know yet. I'm still pretty fuzzy on like all of the relationships between the parts of the outer node. Um, but, you know, today we're shedding a little bit of light on this one particular part called with RPC extensions. Um, so in the node template, this wasn't here at all. I had to add it. If we looked at the full node, then there is already an example of with RPC extensions and they do two of them. They do one for the contracts module and that allows you to do stuff like call a smart contract off chain. So it allows you to be like, okay, there's some smart contract on chain. I think I wanna call it this way, but I wanna make sure it does what I expect first and I wanna know how much gas it costs and all that stuff. So with the contracts RPC extension, you can do that kind of stuff. There's also another one in the full node called transaction payment. And it basically allows you to say, okay, here's an extrinsic I'd like to submit to the chain. How much fees is that gonna cost me? And so you can like know in advance how much fees it's gonna cost. Um, but in the node template, which, you know, is lighter and stripped down, none of that was there. So I just added this with RPC extensions 
you know, it, it takes a function that takes five things. I don't know what most of them are. I just know that the client is the thing. I mean, I, I can guess like this is the transaction pool, for example. Um, I don't know what these ones are. Um, and this is the thing that we're going to use to communicate with the runtime API. So uh, inside this with RPC extensions things, we make a, a mutable IO object. So if any of you are good Rust programmers or familiar with JSON RPC, then probably this looks familiar. Um, I hadn't used JSON RPC before, so I just know like this IO handler is a, a thing that you have to make. And then we can, and it's mutable. So we can take it and we can tack on all of these specific RPC methods to it. And so here's where I did the first one. Do IO extend with, and the syntax is long and I don't know exactly what it all is, but here's where I do my silly RPC. So that's the trait that just defined the signatures. And then part of, oh yeah, was that a question? Oh yeah, maybe not, okay. Um, and then part of what comes with JSON RPC is that you can always do this to delegate. And then this is where we give it a specific instance that implements the RPC. And so if you remember, I just had that, um, that unit struct that I called silly. Um, and so we've done it. So this, this part right here and in, including, you know, returning okay of IO, that's what attaches that RPC that we saw, this one to our actual node and allows us to call it like, for example, with curl the way I did here and get back our result. Um, so any questions about that part so far? Okay. Yeah, cool. So this is, this is one of those projects where I feel like I understand the big picture design and enough of the code that I can sort of do it, but I definitely don't understand like, you know, every single detail about it, but I think that's probably okay. Um, okay, and so then the next thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna add another one of these extensions right here. You can see it looks super similar. We do io.extend with again. We give it some trait that defines an RPC, and then we delegate to some particular instance uh, that implements that trait. And in this case, you know, before I, the instance was just a unit struct, so I just made one right there. In this case, it actually needs a reference to the client, and so I do, um, you know, new, new client. Uh, one thing I will mention here that isn't relevant in this case, because there's only one RPC extension that needs the client, but you can imagine, you know, we have some node that does a bunch of these things, dot, dot, dot. Um, and if you have more than one of them that needs a reference to the client, then what you do here is just client.clone for every one of them until the last one, and then you can just give it ownership of that client. So because I only have one, it is the last one, so I just give it the client itself. Yeah, cool. So I guess then let's start looking at this uh, more interesting RPC method that I added. And I guess first I'll just give you a demo of what it does. So. Here I have apps connected to my blockchain. I'm on 166, block 166, so let's just double check. Yeah, that's, that's the right one. Um, and there's this, there's this runtime palette that I added called sum storage. And this is just like the simplest example I could think of that wasn't totally trivial for implementing a, a runtime API. And so it has two storage values, thing one and thing two, and they're both options for just 32-bit integers. And I, I think on a fresh chain, they're going to be set to none. Yeah, so thing one and thing two are both none. So let's just set them to something real quick. Um, some storage, set thing one, maybe I'll set it to 1300. Uh, okay. Okay, so that looks like it probably worked. We'll double check in a second. And then for thing two, I'll set it to 37. And sign and submit. Okay, and then we'll just double check that worked so our storage values are updated. So thing one gives us 1300 and thing two gives us 37. All right, that's great. This, what I showed you just now has nothing to do with RPCs. That's just a runtime palette that you know we could have written with stuff we've already learned. But the, the example is like, 
imagine that although we want to track these two things separately, maybe because they can be set separately and independently, what people mostly care about and what the UI is going to want to tell you about is the sum of these two things. So we want to make uh, an RPC that will tell us directly the sum of these two things and the node itself will do the summing. Uh, so that's, that's our example. And I'll show you how I call it and then I'll show you the code. So calling it is similar to before. It's called, um, well, there's always the trick of, do you remember the name? Some storage gets some, I think is what I called it. And okay, you can see I got it right because it just gave us result is 1337. But um, <laughs> one of the, the stupid thing that I did for like embarrassingly long when I was practicing this was um, I was calling it like this, just get some. Uh, and so then you get this, you know, error and I don't know what that code means, but probably just method not found. Let's dive back to the code. So some of this code should look similar to what we did with the silly RPC. Like we still have to do all those parts that we've already seen for this one, but then we're, we're going to do more in advance. So with the silly RPC, I just made this other file right here inside the, the node template directory. And that makes sense because it's just an outer node thing. This one, since this new one, since it's going to call into a runtime API, I decided it made more sense to store it with the runtime palette. And uh, that also was inspired by like some examples. So when I was coding this, I looked at transaction payment as an example. And so you can see how this is set up. Like there's the regular source lib that does, uh, you know, your storage items and your dispatchable calls and all of that stuff. And then there's this other folder called RPC. And so I just, um, I just copied that example. So I also have uh, like my RPC and my source, RPC and source. And then I'll tell you about this JavaScript one after we're all done. Okay. Uh, source libRS is exactly what you'd expect. You know, here's um, decal storage. It has my two storage values. Here's decal module. It has set thing one and set thing two. So like that, we already saw all of that stuff in apps and I won't go into that part too much right now. The, the more relevant part for what we're doing right now is this, uh, oh, there's, sorry, there is one thing I wanna show you in here, which is um, it, I have this function in my impl module block. This is not a dispatchable call, so you can't use it like from apps. You can't submit a transaction that calls this, um, but other pieces of the blockchain can call it. So it could be other pieces of the runtime, um, and that's what we're going to do now. So there's just this function called get some and it, um, like right now I did it in kind of a, a stupid way just cause I wanted to have something that worked in time for the, for the seminar. Like probably I should be returning, uh, like an option for a U32. And if either one of the storage values is none, then I'll return none. Um, but what I did right now is just if either one of the storage values is none, then make it default to zero. So like, you know, 10 plus none just equals 10 and none plus none just equals zero. The point is, this is the part where you put like whatever logic you're actually doing. So like in Derek's example, this is where the, the price calculation would happen. So inside my RPC folder, we have source lib RS and um, it looks long mostly because there's a bunch of comments in it, but uh, it will just go from the start. So like copyright stuff, no big deal. A bunch of uses, you know, some of those are interesting and they're maybe worth looking at. Um, here's the part that we saw before. This is the part that looks just like the silly RPC. So we have a trait and I called it some storage API and it has a single function. So before we had two in here, we had hello five and hello seven. This time I just have a single one called get the sum of those two storage values. Um, it has a name that follows the convention I talked about. Some, oh, and, and when you're doing a runtime API RPC, generally the pattern is like, this should be the palette name, and then this is like the method name. So, so this is why like, you know, I guess it's kind of like the snake case versus like the, this style. So like when I'm in apps, I always see like the mixed case kind of thing, but it maps yeah. all the way back to like, snake case functions in the runtime, I guess, sometimes? Yeah, yeah, totally, totally trippy. Um, yeah. I don't know exactly, like, 
all I can say about that is that in Rust, the convention is that, you know, you should do like let um, some variable in the Rust code. And then in JavaScript, you would do, you know, let some variable and you get it. Um, so I know that the Polkadot API does something, I'm not sure quite where or how, that takes Rust style names like this and converts them to stuff like this. Mm -hmm. um, and then here, I know that the convention is you should have like some category, then a single underscore, and then some call like method name. I honestly don't even know if that's enforced. Like it might work just as well if I put a bunch of underscores, uh, but I just tried to stay on the, the well-trodden path for this first example. So, okay, here's, a, here's another thing that I don't like, feel like I have 100% understanding of. Whenever you're doing one of these runtime APIs, it has an option to, like, to query at a specific block height. And I don't know what happens if you query at a block so far ago that your node has like pruned it. Um, and I didn't even really use that, but I know that this made, the, made everything compile. And it was something that I got stuck on and I asked, uh, one of my colleagues named Kian is the guy who wrote this transaction payment example. And you know, when I was in compiler errors, I asked him like, hey man, what is going on with this? And he said, if you're doing a runtime API RPC, just have it be parametric in the block hash and have it take this parameter for a block height. It, it may be possible to get rid of them and everything, but I just didn't do that yet. Well, actually some of Kusama RPC does not have block hashes for, as a parameter. Oh, really? Yep. Oh, that's good to know. Okay, so it probably is possible to get rid of it then. Yeah. Oh, that's, let's actually look at one of those because I think that would be instructive to see like which ones have it and which ones don't. Okay, well, let's do author and uh, pending, pending extrinsics. So basically oh. query transaction pool. Yeah, right. Okay, so one, one thing about, I don't know the pending extrinsics ones that much, but I know for sure that with the author one, um, that's not one that goes to a runtime API. That's one that's more similar to the silly RPC because it'll communicate with the key store, which is also part of the outer node. Okay, yeah, makes sense. I'm just looking if I can find some other RPC code which actually calls some data from the chain. Yeah. Um, let's see. Okay. Maybe get finalized head. Ooh, yeah. So it's RPC chain get finalized head. Oh yeah, right. Yeah, I don't know if that one goes into the into the runtime or not. Get hash of the last finalized block in the canon chain. Yeah, that's a great example though. It doesn't take a block chain. Oh yeah, well that, that that one actually doesn't really make sense to take a block height, I guess, because like there's not a different finalized head per block height. There's just like given yeah. your node what's its view of the finalized head. Yeah, that's a good example. Yeah, nice. Um, Okay, cool. So back to the code. Um, right, so we defined the trait. Um, we defined a struct that's going to implement that trait. So before this was simple, it just said pub struct silly semicolon. But now we actually have to have some, uh, some fields, particularly we need this one, which is an atomic reference count um, reference to the client. And then we also need this phantom data. I think M stands for marker here. And I, you know, this is one of those things that makes the compiler happy because basically we said like uh, that this trait is parametric in a type called block hash, but then we don't actually have any um, items in here that are block hash. So we just put the marker in here. Um, and then, yeah, okay. Here, so this was not in the previous, in the silly RPC. This one is um, just adding a method called new onto my sum storage struct. And the reason we have this new method is because I wanna be able to give it a client and have the client go into this particular field. So this is new from the silly RPC. This was from the transaction payment example. I just commented out, we're not gonna look at it right now. And now this was also in the silly RPC. It looked simpler over there. It said, um, it said like impl silly RPC for silly and that was it. But this time we have these type parameters. So C is the client, block is, um, you know, 
well, I, maybe you don't know, I don't really even know exactly what it is, but um, it was it was part of this stuff about how, um, you know, it was parametric in a block hash and it was related to this and this. So that's that's the part I'm kind of fuzzy on. Um, but this is this is the analogous block, like we're implementing that RPC trait for that struct that we made above. Um, and so great, here is our implementation of this function get sum. And um, it takes self just like before and it takes this block number, just like we said, and it's going to give us a result for u32. So that part's the same as before. Just like how the silly RPC gave us five or seven, this is going to give us the sum of those two values, which is going to be a U32. Um, this, this comment was left, uh, oh wait, let's see, use the API call. By the way, do you see that query info has two args, but we've given it also a block number related to the same hard-coded block generic. So this was left by my colleague, Kian. When I, when I asked him for help, he did like what I love, which was, um, solve the immediate compiler error and then just leave me like exercises to, to keep learning on my own. And um, this query info function he's talking about, that's the one from transaction payment. That's the one that I was using like as my example that I was typing over. So here's the part, we need this in order to do, to use the runtime API. So it's the whole, the whole reason we have the client is because Part of the client is the runtime API, and so we get that right here. We make a reference to it. Um, Kian gave me this, and it makes sense. Like if we didn't, so remember this block height parameter was an option, and like if we didn't specify one, um, then just assume like the best block that we know, like the current tip of the chain. But the the funny thing is like even though he set me up with this, where I can like you know handle the case where the option was a none, then I I ended up not using this. I'm not totally sure how to how to use it still but it's there um so yeah okay so here i say like if we were doing this just exactly like we did with the with the silly rpc then you know great we just return the number that's what we did in the silly rpc but instead we're going to actually call into the runtime api and this is the example that i took from transaction payment so in that case i called api.query info that's the one he was talking about in, in the comment up there and we give it these different, um, you know, these different params. And like, I, I thought at the very beginning that this was kind of it. And this is definitely like the guts, the meat of this call into the runtime API. But then there's something we have to do here to make the error types match up. Cause like the, the runtime API will give us one type of error. And then the JSON RPC expects a particular kind of like server error. So we do this, this map error thing. Um, and maybe I'll just show you our actual one. So here's the guts of the call. We say like, let runtime API result. So let whatever answer the runtime gives us back just come from, you know, again, calling the runtime API, calling the get some function. Oh, I guess I did use the at right there. I haven't tried actually specifying a block height. That might be fun. Okay, and then I do the map error thing. And I took this almost exactly from his um, like the code, I just put a number there. Honestly, I didn't choose it for any particular reason. And I, I bet there's better ways to do this. Like you can see, he took whatever the runtime error was and converted it into, uh, you know, some meaningful integer. And that, that might be part of what I commented out up here. I did notice that he implemented like this, this from error to I 64 trait. So maybe that's what he's doing there, but I, I didn't do any of that. I just said whenever something goes wrong, we're giving it code 9876. Um, and same thing with the message, like we could have definitely done something better there. Uh, but here I did do something kind of useful, which is just take this E, whatever like error string came back from the runtime API and, um, and use that for the data. Um, but I also in this particular runtime API, I don't know how to cause an error. So I've never actually seen this in action. It always has been the success case. So just to, to map what we've done so far, like with the silly RPC, we saw how to just add an RPC to the node that had nothing to do with the runtime here. So, you know, up above everything was basically the same as the silly RPC, but just a little bit more complex. And here is where we actually do the calling into the runtime. Like we get the runtime API, here's where we call it. And then we just do some, some error mapping right here. 
So what we haven't looked at yet is the other end of, of this call, like where we're calling into a runtime API. And so that's the part I'll show you next. Um, so just to remind ourselves of the file structure, we have our sum storage palette. It has the regular old like palette stuff where we do the decal storage and decal module. Um, we have this RPC folder and this is the, the source here. That's the file we just looked at. What we haven't looked at yet is like the actual runtime API part. So I'll show you that. And this is a, a pretty simple file, pretty short file. Um, you know, it, again, it has the regular copyright stuff. It has some stuff for no STD and some uses. And here's the like interesting part. There's this macro, decal runtime APIs. And we give it, uh, you know, this, we give it a single trait called sum storage API, and it has a single function called get the sum. So in order for our RPC to be able to make this call into the runtime API, it has to know that that API exists. And so that's why we give it this trait, this like sum storage API. So if I tried to use that RPC with a runtime that doesn't implement the sum storage API, oh, actually, maybe that's where we would get a, one of those error codes. That would be fun to try to. So we've just defined this really simple runtime API. So you remember those two lines on my diagram, one went from RPC to outside world. That was in the silly RPC and it's what we just spent a while looking at in this example. Then there was that other line that went from the RPC into the runtime. And so that's what we're looking at now. This is where I declare that interface. And then, um, you know, like, so like this comment says, it's implemented in the impl block in the runtime amalgamator file. I never heard this name before, but that's just the regular old like runtime source librs. That's where you do your construct runtime, for example. So we'll, we'll take a look at that. Okay, so here we are in my node template runtime source librs. This is the runtime amalgamator file. And um, let me first give you the context of the part you're familiar with. We have all these palettes. Um, for example, the balances one, we implement its trait. Transaction payment, that was my example. We implement its trait, pseudo trait, et cetera, et cetera. Here's my sum storage trait. Then we do construct runtime. That probably is all familiar. You can see I put sum storage in right here. And then there's the part that I've never talked about on seminar before, which is down below. And it's this impl runtime APIs. And so we can implement whatever runtime APIs we feel like. A whole bunch of these were here already. Like this is the one I showed you guys where we got the metadata. Um, let's see. The, there's the block builder API. Uh, this one has, I'm not exactly sure, but has more to do with consensus. Like the runtime helps author the blocks in some way. I don't feel like I clearly understand that one. Um, there's a bunch more like, you know, there's one, if you want to have off chain workers, you have to implement that API. Here's the one that I was talking about where you can get the authorities and here's ours. Oh, this comment doesn't make sense anymore. When I was stuck, Kian gave me this, this was all commented out and, and it was the error I was stuck on. And the problem was my runtime didn't implement this runtime API. So that's what we do right now. Um, so we're going to implement, you know, that same API that I just showed you guys, um, this one with that single function called get sum. And okay, so here it is. We're implementing that API. Uh, here's the single function called get sum. It has the same signature as before. And uh, so you might remember the final line on my block diagram goes from the big runtime, the whole runtime, to an individual palette. And that's what I do here, where I call this particular sum storage palette, and I call its get sum function. And uh, for some reason, I went a little out of order earlier, and I already showed you this, this get sum function, but maybe just to show it again, it was in the palette itself, in the regular old, uh, you know, source librs right here, impl module, get sum. So the way I implemented my runtime API in the runtime was just to delegate it on to this particular module where the get sum function is. And we already talked about how it just does the, the adding of the two pieces. Um, okay, so yeah, I guess I'll, I'll pause there for a second and see if anybody has any questions. 
a lot of uh, a lot of like barriers to punch through to like get from the outside like all the way into a function i guess <laughs> like, i know yeah. i know we go from the outside to the rpc to the runtime then all the way into the to the palette and honestly like that was the part that was hard to figure out there's i mean any of us could have written this without help probably right um it's just a matter of like wiring up the rpc piece to this piece that's all the way in here uh, i guess you got to be careful that these calls aren't like expensive or anything like this, right? Because they're free to call. So it's kind of like there's like a security element to this too, or thoughtfulness you have to put on. You can't obviously can't change any storage, but you also can't have it be expensive, I guess, either, right? Yeah, so, you definitely can't change any storage. That's for sure. Yeah, that would cause a consensus failure because your node would have a different view of the storage than, you know, someone else's. Oh, I actually, you know, it would be super nice if the compiler complained to you if you tried to do that. I, I didn't try to do that, but that would, well, actually, let's just try it. Thing one, put uh, like, I don't know, five. Um, let's see if that compiles. My, my hope is that the compiler will say like, whoa, you can't mutate storage in an RPC call, but, uh, Oh, actually, I don't think it will say that because this isn't necessarily only used for the RPC. This is also, um, you know, I could call this from a different palette or I could even call it from one of my dispatchable functions. So yeah, that actually might be a really dangerous thing that I just did there. Don't you think some macro keyword will be useful to ensure that part does not modify the storage? Yeah, yeah, I'm now, now that we're thinking about it, I'm trying to figure out like where's the right place to put it because in general, like it's fine that these things modify storage. Like a, a common pattern is that in your dispatchable calls, these ones in DECA module, you just do, you know, like your insurers and checks and preconditions and then you delegate down to one of these functions down here. So I don't know exactly where that would go. I think it's going to compile. It sure seems like it's going to, I'm actually going to kill that so it doesn't overwrite the one that I have working. So I decided to do a little experiment and put this mutation call back inside of this get some function. And so we're going to call it from the RPC and then we're going to see what it does to actual data stored on chain. And the spoiler is that um, any mutation you do in here gets thrown away. It's not going to break consensus or anything like that. So I have a chain running. It's actually the same one from the other day when we did the seminar call and I will do some quick storage queries. So thing one is at 1300, how we left it. And thing two is at 37, just how we left it. So when I call the RPC, we get back the result 44. Well, what the heck is 44? That is the value of thing one, which we put as seven right here. That was the mutation call. It overwrote 1300 and the value 37, which was from uh, V2. So let's just go check on chain. You can see here they didn't change. And just in case you're worried those subscriptions aren't working, we'll just query again real quick. So it doesn't break consensus to have mutation inside your RPC calls. Um, but as we said in the call, it doesn't make a ton of sense to have an RPC method that calls something like this that does mutation. So. If you have a function like this that does mutation, that's great. Use it in your runtime from dispatchable calls. If you have an RPC call coming in, it should probably not do mutation. But just in case you do write bad logic, don't worry. It doesn't break consensus. And then, um, okay. So the, the last thing I want to show, and I, you know, we're almost out of time, so I won't spend forever on it. But, um, you know, I, I assume the reason that anybody's interested in this is not so that you can just do these like curl calls from the command line, but like so that you can also use them in your interface. Like, you know, Derek, you had that nice interface on your on your decks. Um, so I also figured out this piece. And this is just a short script that uses the Polkadot API. It's not part of the React app. Like obviously it, in a final product or even a POC, it would be part of the React app, but I just wanted to get like uh, the, the most basic thing to work. And so, um, you know, here's where I just import the Polkadot API. And then most of the time what happens is you see something uh, that looks like this, like you do const API and you call this API promise.create. 
And you can even you can even give it nothing in here, and it will just use a bunch of default, like default types, the default WebSocket provider, which I've also used, and the default RPC extensions, which is none. Um, but in this case, I gave it some particular RPC extensions. And so what basically what I'm doing is I'm saying, I want to use the Polkadot API, but it doesn't know that I've added these custom RPCs onto my node. And I have to teach it how to call those. Like, I mean, at minimum, I need to teach it what the names of those things are. Mm -hmm. So that's what this constant here is for. Um, it's an object and you give it keys where the keys are the names of your, um, you know, your RPC, like the, the categories basically is what I call them. I don't really know the proper vocab for that thing. Um, but you remember I had the ones that were hello underscore five and hello underscore seven. So here's hello. And then it's a list. And in that list, there's an object for each one of the calls. And so there's hello underscore five. That's this one. You know, this is just convenient. It doesn't need to need to be there. This one doesn't take any params and it returns a U32. And same for seven. That looks pretty much the same. Then in a separate category, we have some storage. And again, it's a list, but this list only contains a single object because I only had a single um, RPC method under the some storage heading. Uh, give it a description. I told it the name, get some, uh, same, no params, and returns U32. So now that I've set up this RPC constant, I pass it in when I create my API instance. And now here's the, like, here's the interesting part of my script. So I, I say, uh, we'll query the, the custom silly RPC. So we're going to query this custom silly RPC. And so the way you do it is you call api.rpc.whatever.whatever. .whatever. And those are the, you know, the two whatevers that we've seen that I specified up here in this constant the category and the specific method. Um, and then I just printed them out. The values from the silly RPC are, you know, spoiler, it says five and seven. Um, and now here's where I start using the more interesting one. So this is the old school way where we don't use a custom RPC and it's a design we talked about last week and earlier today. Um, and glad that you mentioned also where we just, uh, you know, we query the storage the way we always have like API query the temp or the, um, the palette name and then the storage name. And then I did this, uh, like the individual storage values are 1337. And then the sum is 1337. Uh, that's the old fashioned way. And then here's where we finally use our custom RPC. So we do api.rpc.category name, dot method name. And then I, uh, you know, I just printed out like the sum query directly from the RPC is whatever it is. Okay. So as we expected, the silly values are five and seven. Those are never going to change. They're literally hard coded to the RPC. Here's the individual ones. Here's where we sum them in JavaScript. And then here's the same number where we sum them in rest inside the node. So, okay. That is, uh, that was my tour of hacking on the RPC. Is there any way to call RPC not RPC, but runtime API without RPC module involved. So basically when you showed the scheme of the node, can we just call the blue line calling the node without calling the RPC module? Yeah, um, you're thinking about like calling into the runtime API here? Yes, exactly, from my application outside the node. No, the only way you can communicate from your application outside the node is through this RPC. So if I want to utilize some modules that are not covered by RPC part, I should design my own RPC part, right? Uh, wait, wait, say that one more time. Uh, I mean, if I want to utilize some uh, API calls provided by pellets, but does not include it in RPC part, I should mm -hmm. extend the RPC part of node by myself, and I can do that yeah. even on Kusama. Oh, even on Kusama, that's an interesting idea. Um, so, okay, yeah, like you're saying you want to add an RPC that queries something of, that you care about from Kusama? Yes, so from one of the pilot, because I believe current RPC part does not cover all possible runtime API calls exposed by pilots on Kusama. 
Yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool. I see what you're saying. So there's some runtime API that's already in the Kusama runtime, but it's it's just not wired up this way. It's not wired up to an RPC. Yep. So yeah, totally. So you can you can hack the node and add whatever RPC calls you want. It won't break consensus because it you know it didn't change the runtime. It didn't do anything with consensus. And then anyone who runs the code that you wrote will be able to make those RPC queries. Okay, and the right place to see the entire runtime API is that amalgamator file. Yeah, exactly. Yep, uh, runtime source librs. Yeah, that's where you'll see because there was you know at the bottom under construct runtime that's where they have the like impl runtime APIs and you can see what they all are there. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. And I, it sounds like you get this, but maybe just to say it in the recording anyway. Um, like if we're talking about Kusama specifically and we want to do something like adding in a palette, you know, like we talked about in this example, like that's not trivial on Kusama because you'd have to put it through democracy and get enough people to agree on it. But Gleb, it sounds like what you're talking about is a runtime API that's already there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That was yeah, cool. uh, the question. That, if you, you know, I don't know if you're just thinking out loud or if that's something you want to try, but if, if you do try it, I'd love to show it on the seminar whenever you have it. Okay, so the thing I definitely want to try because one of the projects we maintain is the API Explorer for Kusama for entire Substrate ecosystem, and we want to expose as much as possible. Mm -hmm. um, okay, cool. Should we end there, or does anybody else have anything they want to say? Well, thanks for putting it together. I think it's uh, I'll have a good good roadmap now to figure out how to add that to my, my project. Yeah, cool. All right. Yeah, you're welcome. And I, I know, I don't know if you guys saw, Phil was asking about RPCs and Substrate Technical right before this too. So hopefully, uh, and Jimmy, like we said last week, Jimmy was asking about that too. So, cool. Um, okay. Thanks, well, Josh. thanks everybody for coming. Nice to meet you. Everybody who was, who was new or new-ish. And um, just a reminder, as always, if you want to show off something you've been working on, like Derek did today, that's always very welcome. So you can, um, you know, say so now or hit me up on Riot or email or a GitHub or anything. All right. Thanks. See you guys next time. Thanks, everyone. Yep. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Yoshi. That's all.